Wow. That's good. Mm. That's good. Amen. 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 Guys, we have a choice. We can either love him or we can do this. Let's love him. Let's love him. Let's trust him. He's perfect in all his ways. We just trust you, God. We don't understand, but we trust you. Yeah. Well, I don't know why Neil and Serena picked uh, a day yesterday where the air was liquid, humidity, (laughs) but some of us helped get them moved, and I have never, ever in my pastoral life ever asked this request. But uh, somebody out here has the capability to go over to their house and take apart the box spring we could not get upstairs, get it upstairs, put it back together for them. They, they moved into a, one of those old houses, and Janice and I did one time, and we couldn't get the box spring up the steps. So if anybody in here is like that, who'd be willing to help them out, uh, you can either see Serena if you know her, or if you don't know Serena, say, uh, talk to me and I'll get you hooked up. I never had, I've never asked that before in my life, but that's a, that's a way we can, um, we can partner together. Last week, Pastor Ben preached um, the first in our, well, the second in our series on Philippians. He preached verses 3 to 11 out of the first chapter and emphasized the partnership that we're in wonderfully. Thank you, Pastor Ben. Really good job. But that's a way that we can be a partner to the Hazlitt family, just like we can partner now with the Lobdell family. And we just want to help each other. We just want to be be family. Do you have your Bibles? Let's go to Philippians chapter 1. In that light, I should probably tell you, I actually stuck this in, Philippians 1, because I got this this week. We have uh, one of our staff people over at the Mount Gilead Nazarene Church. It's called Fresh Faith. Uh, their house needs a new roof. And you say, oh, well, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Here's what it says. We've recently been blessed with a company giving us all the materials we need for our roof, which is really cool. We now need laborers to help us install it. If anyone has metal roofing experience, we would love some help. So if that's you, if that's you, contact the church office and we'll get you hooked up. Um, Just partnering together, I think that's a great, great thing. All right. You ready to get into Philippians 1? How about this little card we've been carrying around? I say we. I'm hoping it's we. It's been me. I hope it's been we carrying around all week. Did you take your theme verse from last week and stick it in your pocket, carry it around? Uh, We're trying to give you a theme verse for every week. And last week it was verse 11 out of chapter 1. May you be filled with all the fruit of your salvation. The righteous character produced in you, produced in your life by Jesus Christ. For this will bring much glory and praise to God. That's really what this life in Christ is all about. Being so filled that we can bring glory to God by how we live our lives. Romans chapter 12, 2. So today, let's jump in. uh, Verse 12. And I want you to know, my dear brothers and sisters, that everything that has happened to me here has helped to spread the good news. Well, we better put that in context a little bit. Paul wrote to the church in Philippi, to the Philippians, from a Roman prison. Paul spent about 25% of his ministry life in prison. And here he is again in prison, and he's writing to the Philippian church, his partners, the ones who care for him. He says, I want you to know that everything that has happened to me here, where's here? Prison. Everything that's happened here has helped to do what? Spread the good news. What if instead of this, we would do this and let God flow through us? In a Roman prison, the gospel is advanced. I actually want to take you from from verse 12 back to verse 5. 
Paul says, whenever I pray, I make my request for all of you with joy, for you've been my partners, Pastor Ben, you've been my partners in spreading the good news. That's what Paul was all about. So he partners with a church, but he also shares the good news in prison. Verse 13, for everyone here, including the whole palace guard, knows that I'm in chains because of Christ. Now let me give you a picture of what's happening here. Paul, Paul was in prison, but he was the, in the kind of prison where he was not sitting in a jail. He actually had his own lodging. That was one of the options, depending on what your, what your uh, crime was, what your, your um, oh, what's the word? Not conviction. Your, your, help me. Your, your, no, not sentence. Your charge. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you. Your charge, whatever your charge was, you had the option of, of having your own, uh, your own housing which is what Paul did. So his friends could come and go, and they could care for his needs. As a matter of fact, um, in, in these days, there was no laundry that came with the, uh, with the prison sentence, so, so uh, his friends had to do his laundry for him. Partners. So here's Paul in his house, but the kicker is that the Roman soldiers took turns coming in and being chained to Paul. So every day a Roman soldier would come from the highest, uh, the highest ranking uh, army. Uh, the, 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 the thought there is the whole palace guard, that means it's probably the praetorium. Some of your uh, translations would even have that word in there. So these are the elite soldiers. So they would take turns coming. Now, now here's the picture. Every day a different soldier comes and is chained to Paul all day and sits there while Paul's friends come. And as Paul's friends come, what are they talking about? The good news. So these soldiers are hearing the good news all day. Now what do you think Paul talks about when his friends aren't there? What do he and, what do he and that Roman soldier talk about? The calves? The buckeyes? The crops? Nope. Jesus. And so Paul says, in verse 13, everyone here, including the whole palace guard, knows that I'm in chains because of Christ. And because of my imprisonment, most of the believers here have gained confidence and boldly speak God's message without fear. Have you ever been with someone who was bold for Christ and because they were bold, your boldness, your courage raised? That's the idea here. So Paul says to the Philippian church, I'm in, I'm in prison, but I want you to know that the gospel is advancing. Verse 15, it's true that some are preaching out of jealousy and rivalry. But others preach about Christ with pure motives. Some have pure motives, some have false motives. We want our church to be better than Paul's church. So we put Paul down, and we're preaching Christ, putting Paul down. So some of, their, some of their motives weren't so pure. Some of them just didn't like Paul. And so they wanted to dig at Paul by having a bigger church. You know, those kinds of pastors are professional pastors. They have a job title, but they're really not God's servants. Verse 16, they preach because they love me, for they know, these are the ones who preach with pure motives, they preach because they love me, for they know I've been appointed to defend the good news. Those others do not have pure motives as they preach about Christ. They preach with selfish ambition, not sincerely intending to make my chains more painful to me. But that doesn't matter whether their motives are false or genuine. The message about Christ is being preached either way, so I rejoice. And I will continue to rejoice. For I know that as you pray for me, and the Spirit of Jesus Christ helps me, this will lead to my deliverance. Is it possible for you and me to do good news things? Is it possible for you and me to do church 
things, is it possible for us to do Christian things and not have the right motive? Is it possible for us to do good things with a wrong motive? Is it, is it possible for us to do good things for our glory? No, we want to do everything we do for the sake of the kingdom of God. Paul's focus was the good news. Paul always looked to the big picture. He overlooked differences, and he allowed for a different approach. You know, that other church doesn't do it the way we do it, but that's okay. The gospel's going forward. The kingdom's being advanced. That would be Paul's attitude. And here's something to consider. Their victory is our victory. Friends, as we release Patris and Naomi, and I've talked to you about that, as we release them to ministry among people of different uh, ethnic backgrounds in Columbus or Toledo or Cleveland or Cincinnati, wherever it would be, if they get a victory, that's our victory. See, we've got to quit this, uh, our church, their church, that, that role, that, that, that award. It's kingdom stuff. So, out of, uh, out of Philippians 1, 12 to 19, I have five thoughts I want to share with you today. And um, I, I was actually praying this morning thinking that one of these five thoughts is going to be for you. Probably not five out of five, but one of these five. Let's see what Paul's letter to the church in Philippi could be could mean to us today at high point. One of five. Number one, I think, um, I think Paul would tell us, bloom where you're planted. Bloom where you're planted. You know, we're so good at thinking about what we don't have. You know, if we had more money, if we had a better pastor if we had different people, if we lived in a different town, if we lived at a different time, if we could just go back, or if we could just go forward, or if we just had more of this or more of that, if we just... And what happens, friends, when we start talking about if we just, we miss what could be. Bloom where you're planted. Excuses alibis really don't work in the kingdom. For two and a half years that I've been here as pastor, we've really been operating with no money for ministry. The amount of money that has come in in these two and a half years, and really even before I got here, has basically paid the mortgage, kept the lights on, paid for the internet, paid for the insurance, all the bills, if you will. We really haven't had money to do ministry. And yet, look around you. Look at what God is doing, friends. Look at what's happening at High Point. Bloom where you're planted. Wherever that is, just shine for Jesus. You're working a job you don't like? Well, I think it's okay to look for a different job, but while you're working it, bloom! Bloom! You know, the world around us picks up on our attitudes when we grumble, when we complain. Someone has said, God doesn't care about your ability nearly as much as he cares about your availability. Are you available to God? Are you available for him to flow through? He could take what you don't have and make you into something that he can use. If you're in prison, share Christ with the guards. Point two. Okay, point one is bloom where you're planted. Point two. Evangelism is not just an option. Evangelism is vital. Paul says we've got to preach Christ. We've got to, excuse me, we've got to show Christ in everything we do. The early church was so in love with Christ 
that Christ is all they talked about. I just described that picture to Paul and his friends, about Paul and his friends just talking about Christ to the point where the whole Roman guard had heard about Jesus. The early church was so in love with Christ that it's all they talked about, so the Greek culture around them began calling them Christ people. They actually gave them the name Christian because it's all they talked about. I wonder what our culture would say about us. Paul lived evangelism. See, we can put together a program and we can have a training session where we, where we take this, this evangelism program and we could go out and we could live the program, but how much better if we just just brought evangelism into our lives? What if we just talked about Christ? What if we just lived his love? What if we just shared with the world what, who Christ is, not only by our words, but by our actions? Did you hear about the Chick-fil-A down in uh, Orlando? Many of you have heard about that Chick-fil-A. If you don't know the story, Chick-fil-A has taken a stand against the homosexual lifestyle. And they've been much abused, haven't they, in the media because of it. And yet, out of last week's terrible, terrible events, a Chick-fil-A stayed open on Sunday, a day they don't normally open, and they made sandwiches and lemonade and gave them free of charge to the families and to the people that were coming out of that whole scenario. And I don't know all the details of that. But you know what they did, friends? Without saying a word, they showed Christ. Lifestyle evangelism is so crucial, so crucial. This church, High Point Church, will grow most when, when we share the evangelism responsibilities and not depend on the pastor. When you, just out of the course of your lifestyle, share with your neighbors, your coworkers, even somebody you might run into at the store, and invite them to church, now, we have to be careful, friends, that ultimately what we want to do is invite them to Christ. Because I hear people sometimes say, well, I wish so-and-so would get back in church. Well, I wish so-and-so would come to Christ. I think if they came to Christ, they'd come to church. So let's not, let's not, just, let's not stop short and just get people to church, but that is a starting point. And so I admonish you, I challenge you, I encourage you. Invite those that are around you your circles, or in your circles, to come to church and be a part of who we are here. Paul shared with those around him, who is around you to share Christ with? Do the people around you know your love for Christ? Do they know that you're a Christ follower? Or do they just know that you go to church? Because there's a difference. Do they know that you love Jesus or do they just know that you won't go certain places and do certain things? Let's, let's talk Jesus. We don't have to shove it down anybody's throat. We don't have to be arrogant, elitist. But let's, let's try to incorporate into our lifestyle, friends, evangelism. Because the truth is you're preaching something. Every one of you are preaching something. Maybe it's materialism. Maybe that's the message you're preaching, that you really like stuff, that stuff is really important to you. Or maybe you're preaching family. I hear people say all the time, you know, family's the most important thing. No, it's not. No, it's not. Friends, family is not the most important thing to you. Jesus is the most important thing. Don't tell me what to say, Pastor. Well, I'm just speaking. That's what the Bible says. That's what the Bible says. Love the Lord supremely. So don't say family's, family's the most important thing. Family in the kingdom of God is very important, and I won't diminish that. And I believe your family is important, but you're preaching something. Don't preach that fam family's the most important. Maybe you're preaching fear. If you live life in fear, that's what you're preaching to people around you. Maybe you're preaching addiction. 
Maybe you just can't seem to live without this or that. And, and that's the message that you're giving. Maybe you're preaching religion. Friends, don't preach religion. Don't preach religion. Preach Jesus. Don't preach religion. Maybe you're preaching your past. Maybe you just can't live in the present because of your past. And so that's what people around you know about you. Or maybe for you it's future. You're just always looking to the future instead of the present. Or maybe you're preaching Christ. Or maybe you're preaching something else. But every one of you are preaching something. You're all preaching to the people around you. Let's preach Jesus. Philippians chapter 3. Now, I know that that's a few weeks down the road where we'll preach it, but if you have your Bibles open or your phones, look at Philippians chapter 3, verse 17. Dear brothers and sisters, by the way, I think this is so good. I, I'm excited to preach this. Dear brothers and sisters, pattern your lives after mine. I'm going to read on, but let's stop there for a moment. How many people in our world say, hey, follow me? How many people in the church say, hey, follow me? You know what I hear most often? Oh, don't look at me. Don't look at me. Don't look at me. I blow it. Don't, don't look at me. I'm not a good example. What if we had some people that were willing to say, yes, I do blow it, but pattern your life after mine because I'm headed to the cross. What if we had some people that were willing to say it? Paul did, and it wasn't arrogant. It was not arrogant when Paul said this. Dear brothers and sisters, pattern your lives after mine and learn from those who follow our example. For I've told you often before, and I say it again with tears in my eyes, that there are many whose conduct shows they are really enemies of the cross of Christ. They are headed for destruction. Their God is their appetite. They brag about shameful things and they think only about this life here on earth. But we are citizens of heaven where the Lord Jesus Christ lives and we are eagerly, uh, eagerly waiting for him to return as our Savior. He will take our weak mortal bodies and change them into glorious bodies like his own using the same power with which he will bring everything under his control. Amen. Amen. Okay. Bloom where you're planted. Evangelism is vital. And thirdly, let me ask you the question, what about these chains? What about these chains? Paul's in prison, chained to a Roman guard. Some of the time, Paul's in prison, chained to a, um, chained to a, a wall or a big, a big rock. Uh, what about these chains? Let me talk to you about a Nesiphorus. Anybody ever heard of a Nesiphorus? Not many of us. A, Nes a Nesiphorus obviously lived back at this time because who today is going to name their kid a Nesiphorus? I don't even know what you would shorten that to. Oni. So a Nesiphorus was a friend of Paul. And I'd actually like to read to you about what Paul said about him. Go to 2 Timothy chapter 1. And I invite you to actually go there so you can see it in black and white. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 16 to 18. Now Paul is also um, writing a letter to Timothy from the same Roman prison. So he's talking about these chains that he's in. And he says in verse 16 of chapter 1, May the Lord show special kindness to Onesiphorus, and all his family, because he often visited and encouraged me. He was never ashamed of me because I was in chains. He was never ashamed of me because I was in chains. When he came to Rome, he searched everywhere until he found me. May the Lord show him special kindness on the day of Christ's return. And you know, very well how helpful he was in Ephesus. Onesiphorus encouraged Paul in spite of the chains. He was not ashamed of the chains. He was helpful while Paul was in chains. Could we even say that he entered into Paul's prison with him? What would happen in the church 
if we would enter into each other's prison? What would happen if we were fresh people in the midst of their chains? What would happen if we were not ashamed, but we loved each other in spite of our chains? Now, now I'm going to use throughout this message today chains in two different ways, and I don't want you to be confused. In this setting, in, for this moment, let's think of our chains as the things about us that we don't like. Let's think about our chains as uh, our bruises, our scabs, our warts, the things, our, our shortcomings, okay? Our shortcomings. What would happen if we would seek to refresh one another in the midst of our chains? What would happen if we weren't ashamed of each other, but we just loved. I think, um, I think the world would be turned upside down. Sometimes we keep people in their chains even when they've been freed. Let me say that again. Sometimes we keep people in their chains even when they've been freed. We look at people based on their past. Um, I, I, I have heard in the church, I'm sure I've heard it here, but I'm, I'm speaking more generally now. I, I've heard in the church people say things like this. Well, you know, you know what they used to be. Somebody's, um, somebody's name will come up for a position. I don't know. I don't know. You, let, me, let me tell you about what, about what their life used to be like. Now, now, we can all agree that there's wisdom there, and we have to have discernment to make the right choice in that situation. I, I get that. There are times where we have to be cautious because of someone's past. But friends, way more times than that, we hold people to their past when Christ has done a work in their lives and they are not the same people. Can I get an amen from anybody? Would one person say amen to that? Come on, we've got to be better than that. We've got to look at each other through the eyes of Christ. And even if we see a chain, we've got to refresh and encourage and help people in the midst of their chains. Okay, point four. Paul wanted to be delivered. So here's the other kind of chain. Don't get confused. <laughs> Sorry. Um, Paul says, let's actually read it. Let's read it. Verse 19. Back in Philippians 1. Paul says, For I know that as you pray for me and the Spirit of Jesus Christ helps me, this will lead to my deliverance. Now, Paul didn't want to stay in chains. Paul just embraced where he was and tried to make the most of it. He tried to, be, he tried to bloom where he was planted. But he also wanted to be delivered. So, so that's, this is where the differentiation comes. Yes, we have to overlook each other's chains, and we have to refresh each other and help each other in the midst of our chains. But we also want to help to, do, to be freed. Right? Right? Right. Uh, I think our churches are full of good Christians who love God, who are not free. We're just not free. We've got, a, we've got a hurt that goes back, and we just can't seem to get over that hurt. We've got, um, we've got a memory, or we've got a past, or we have an addiction. Many times, most times, it's a secret addiction, but we have an addiction, and we just can't get free. And every time we start to make progress in our spiritual lives, the enemy reminds us that there's still that thing in your life.
and we come to church and we sing the songs and we're sincere and we pray the prayers and we're sincere and we open the Word of God and we want to learn and we're sincere and we serve and we're sincere and yet there's that thing, that thing that keeps us from being really free, really free. And the enemy just beats us up with it. When Paul's talking about deliverance, yes, he is talking about um, his physical chains. He wants to be delivered. He wants to be freed from his physical chains. But the word he uses here is an idea of, I want to be free now, but I also want to stay free. I want to be free forever. So let's think about this idea of somebody today really wants to get free. Somebody out here really recognizes they need to get free. Not just for today, but forever. As a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, I think that point is so crucial to us that before I preach point five, I want to pause and pray. Let's pray. If you're that person today, that needs to get free of whatever it is, whether it's big or little, but you just can't get free. Pray with me. Lord Jesus, I pray right now for all the struggles, Lord, of our people. I pray today, God, for the thing that just keeps, for the, for the thing that just keeps people from being free. I pray, God, I pray today, Lord, that you would come and move in, Lord, whatever it is. Now help us to do our part. Friends, we've got to release it. Give it to him. Give it to him today. And here's the thing that really breaks the enemy's power is, is confession, repentance. Repent of it. Even if you're not, even if it wasn't your fault, repent that you've held on, you've allowed it to fester, you've allowed the bonds, uh, the chains to, to bind you. Now, let's just, everyone, close your eyes, will you? Because this is a private moment. I wonder if uh, you'd be willing to just let the pastor know who you are. Would you just raise a hand? See him? Yep, see him. See him? Yep, yep, yep. Anybody else? Anybody else? I see him. Yep. In the name of Jesus, we want to be free. And we plead the blood of Christ today. We plead the blood of Christ over these who are in bondage. Come on, Christian, let's pray. Let's pray. Guys, we're not, we're not the church we should be or could be if all we do is just come and go through the motions. Come on, let's get free today. In the name of Jesus. Satan, you have no authority in this place. The blood of Christ has given us the option, if we embrace it, to hold on, to, to, to live free, to live victorious. And I pray today, Lord, that today would be a marked day in the lives of these to get free. And I pray it in Jesus' name. All God's people said, Amen. Amen. Friends, I want to walk your journey with you. If I can help you, you contact me. I'm willing. I don't have all the answers, but I guarantee you I know a God who does. I guarantee you. And we'll, we'll, we'll do it together. Okay, point five. This is the last one. Rejoice is a choice. Verse 18, he's talking about the, right, the motives of people in preaching. He says, but that doesn't matter. The message, oh, see, whether their motives are false or genuine, excuse me, the message about Christ is being preached either way. So I what? Rejoice. But I want you to look at the next sentence, okay? 
Look at the next sentence. And I will continue to rejoice. That is a choice. That is an attitude to say, I will continue to rejoice. He didn't say, I'm going to continue to be happy. No, no, no. There's lots of days Paul was not happy. And we keep knocking ourselves out to get happiness. And all the time, what God wants for us is joy. Now, happiness isn't bad. It's not wrong. It's just that we can't, we can't live on happiness. Because i got to tell you, Don's probably not happy today. He's going to bury his lifelong sister on Wednesday. But you got joy, don't you, John? It's got John. John Don. Don's got joy. Or John's got doy. Either way. Either way you want to look at it. I love that sentence. And I will continue to rejoice. It's up to you. It's up to me. Don't let circumstances steal your joy. Don't let other people steal your joy. It's a lie if you say to somebody, you make me so mad. Nobody can make you mad unless you choose to be mad. And I will continue to rejoice. Romans 12, 2. Change your mind. Don't conform. Be transformed. Change your mind. Don't settle, friends, for grumbling and complaining and negativity. Don't, don't settle for searching to be happy when all the time what's out there for you is joy. We're going to talk more and more about joy as we go through the book. All through the summer. Do you have your little card from your, from your uh, bulletin? Pull it out. Pull it out. Let's read it together. This is our theme verse for the week. Here we go. Or if you don't, if you don't have it, let's get verse 12 up, Matt. Can you do that? That way people that don't have a bulletin or don't have a card can get it up. There we go. Let's read it together. And I want you to know, my dear brothers and sisters, that everything that has happened to me here has helped to spread the good news. If you don't have a card uh, from the bulletin, uh, do we have a stack or not? Okay. There's, but there's some bulletins back there. There's bulletins back there that have cards. Grab one. This is our theme verse for the week. Okay. 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 